Um, so yeah, my name is Michael. Um, Margot is next to me. She will talk a little bit uh, later. I will start our presentation about a couple of successful campaigns that we rolled out in World of Tanks in Europe. Um, from our headquarters in Paris. We are a publishing office. Our development sits in Minsk, actually. Um, yeah, that's basically me. I'm the, the live operation manager. And uh, again, Margot will talk a little bit later. Um, we will talk mostly about our flagship title, which is World of Tanks, the PC version. We have a mobile version, Blitz. We have also a console version. But today is dedicated about uh, the PC version. It's a title that is basically eight years on the market. We have a huge uh, player base. We have a very good, uh, or we have a priv privilege that actually our average age audience is like 31 years old, which is a very, very, very nice age of people you want to address because they are very well uh, aware of the hobby and they like to spend. Um, before I go into any more details, I would like to show you uh, our latest update video about World of Tanks for the people who do not know what it is about. I mean, the title says it basically, but I think we can just have a quick look in uh, our trailer. Yeah, so if you really like to blow things up, I mean, World of Tanks is really the game where you, where you wanna do it. Um, just for me and my better understanding of the audience, somebody played World of Tanks here already, or do I, yeah, a couple of guys know about it. Perfect, um, okay, anyway. So live operations for World of Tanks in Europe, what does that mean? So we have a live operations department in Europe. We have obviously a head, and then we have three uh, subunits in our department. So the first one is a server-side event team. That's basically uh, my guys and me, and we are in charge of creating um, weekend specials or engagement events, monthly missions, everything what Toyt actually uh, talked about before, to keep our audience engaged, while at the same time we're creating premium shop offers and other um, ways for our audience to monetize and, and pay us, basically, because World of Tanks is a free-to-play game, so it's very important for us that we are not forgetting about monetizing this title, and that's basically what we are doing. Uh, the second unit we are having is our BI team. Basically, every decision we, we do is, uh, has been checked by them before, and every event has been post-checked by them, so we can adjust our strategy depending on the outcome. And then last but not least is our PRMP team. It's Player Relation Management Program, where actually Margot is in charge of, and she will talk about it a little bit later uh, in the presentation. Um, give you a quick overview of how we are handling the live operation on a, on a daily basis is basically um, when our game gets huge updates from the development section, meaning new game modes or new content that has been released in updates, our live operation challenge is actually not very high because we are getting covered by our development team with very nice beats. The server-side event team always has to become very active when we are not having any development beats or premium tanks or new tech lines that people can play with or engage with. Um, basically, we are, have to be there when everything, when basically when our engagement is very flat. That goes all back to creating weekly engagement missions, weekend specials where people come, buy stuff or log in and do missions. And at the same time, again, we're creating lots of content where people can actually uh, buy and monetize as they go to our premium shop and uh, pay the items or the goods they basically need. So this is something we do uh, all the time and we focus a lot on, again, when we do not have a lot of development beats to cover. And all this, what I just mentioned, is highly supported, again, by the PRMP team. Again, a couple of examples will follow later in the presentation. Now, the challenging, uh, the challenging, or the couple of challenges we want to tackle in this short time frame we have is actually about the first being that World of Tanks is eight years on the market. So when the product is eight years on the market or successfully on the market, hopefully you have a lot of content and updates run in the past. That also means that your, that your game becomes really huge and complex. You have a lot of premium content in this game and it might become actually invisible to your audience because they take it for granted. And if you don't promote it properly, you might actually stagnate in revenue. The next one is obviously, for every game, the community. If you do not understand your community, or if you only listen to a certain amount of feedback from certain platforms, you might get blindsided, and you really need to follow up on this one. Um, 
high level of complexity, what we mean by this is basically, uh, again, World of Tanks being eight years on the market is a very huge product that also creates a lot of data that we need to compile, to translate, and to understand. That leads to a lot of opportunities for A-B testing and prototyping. Nevertheless, it's a big challenge for us to take the right decisions for the future. And then last but not least, a very important part for our European publishing office is the West versus East price strategy. Um, and I will actually start with this one right now. So we have the luxury again for World of Tanks that we are very successful on the Western markets in Europe, while we are also very successful on the Eastern market. The easy example you can take here is back, actually look at Germany and look at uh, Poland. And the difference in those countries, obviously, is that we have a very strong purchasing power in Germany, in the West, while the Polish purchasing power is uh, way below that. Nevertheless, we are targeting the same people with the same options, right? And we need to tackle this uh, with, uh, with, a pr with a three price point strategy, which we came up with. So. What we normally, normally did in the past, um, we would roll out a brand new tier 8 tank, that's kind of an end game uh, premium tank you can buy that gives you some um, uh, advantages in, in, in progressing in the game. And let's say the base price would be 40 euros, that means that the Polish people pay 40 bucks, while at the same time in Germany you pay 40 bucks. And then we actually released a couple of years ago a very nice German tank. We saw a huge spike in transactions, but nearly no spike in revenue, and that's obviously very alarming. So we, in, we, deep, uh, sorry, we investigated that further with our BI team, and we learned very quickly that uh, by just offering one bundle, we are, you know, don't give any opportunity for, for the Western whales or higher spending audience to do an upsell. So we came up with this price strategy that actually um, has uh, three price points. We keep the base one because every community or paying or member should always have the chance to buy the new content without any inflating uh, value or, or, or stuff we add on top. While at the same time, we would introduce uh, the Ultimate and the Supreme Bundle. And the only difference you're having here is actually that the Ultimate gets premium time and other currencies on top, and the Supreme gets even more on top, and we put a little bit of a discount and a motivation towards the higher price points. The price points for Ultimate and Supreme are around 60 to up to 100 euros. And with our following sales after the, after the one I just described, we dipped into the, we dipped into the data again. And we could see that we maximized our revenue by this strategy by up to 30%. Meaning that a lot of um, people from the West actually uh, did not go for the standard version, but they dived into Supreme, actually Ultimate and mostly Supreme. So it was a very good way for us to maximize our revenue from our Western audience by not uh, uh, gambling uh, or upsetting people by removing the standard one. So that was a very very important lesson we learned and we are using this strategy actually until today. Obviously we are still looking into more um, uh, strategies on how to address the issue but that's the one that works very well for World of Tanks. Um, the challenge I meant before that when you have a game that is very big and we released a lot of premium content over the past uh, yeah, eight years, you are actually ending up with a lot of premium tanks that makes it very difficult for audience to decide actually what kind of content they want to buy because there are so many of them and they need a kind of a guidance. And at the same time, when we actually were tracking the revenue of our tier 8 vehicles, you see the flat line here, tier 8 vehicles, just for you to understand, is our main revenue cost when it comes to premium tanks. And we actually noticed that the revenue is very flat. By flat, I mean that it's not really bad, but if you have a, a very flat line of revenue over 12 months, you might challenge yourself and think you can do better than that. So we actually did a very, very easy thing, and I'm glad that Toit mentioned that before, because we did not discount those vehicles, but we added a couple of things on top for free, but we kept the minimum buy price. I would like to give you the 40 euro example again. So we would take a tier eight tank that always costs 40 bucks and the revenue is flat. Then we would just add 30 days of premium, premium account, I guess everybody knows what that means, on top and a couple of free goods in terms of missions. And we, we kicked it off, we promoted it heavily and suddenly we could actually on day one uh, uh, increase our revenue by 35% on, on, on that first day. And then it goes a bit down. The red line shows basically the, the next tier eight of the week and then it goes further like this. So this is just the result of one month. Everybody who follows World of Tanks a bit more actively sees actually that we're having tier eight of the week mostly running every actually every, every month they are there. And if you multiply this success, we, we uh, uh, rolled out here by 12, I can promise you that the in increase or the maximization of your revenue is actually significant and will help you a lot towards your end of year goals. Um, this is my personal favorite. It's, um, it's something we were challenged in, uh, in December, so how to maximize our revenue 
um, in December when people really want to spend, right? So we came up with, uh, I mean, we didn't came up with an event calendar. The event calendar was way before. It's basically when you guys starting to steal the chocolate of your kids, and I'm including them myself as well, right? So the concept is very easy. For 24 hours, starting from December of one, we are taking a rare vehicle from our pool, things that are normally not available, or content that is normally not available, and we push it out there for 24 hours. And at the same time, we are getting a huge amount of feedback and hype from our community because for our core, getting rare tanks is something really, really cool. And they start actually to produce video content and guessing games in the, in the forums, like what is the next tank they are rolling out? Is it maybe a new one or is it maybe the Type 59 as an insider joke here in this case? And they really follow you a lot. We're using the basic and the upsell offers, so you have different kind of price strategies or price tags that we are using for the East and the West, what I explained before. Um, a bitter uh, lesson we, we uh, learned in 2012, which was very bitter. When I designed our first ever advent calendar in 2012, I was focusing only on monetization, meaning I had 24 premium tank offers rare only for the minority of our player base, which is the paying ones, right? I guess it's for every free-to-play game the case. The problem we had that during Christmas, we had a, a very con a big concern in the community that we are catering only to the payers, and non-payers don't like that. And I had a very hard time trying to, to, to fix it. And actually, in 2012, we didn't really fix it. But what we learned from it is that on the following calendar, and until, actually until now, all the calendars we are doing, having, for example, hidden bonus codes that you know, we reveal every day a part of it. So people follow it. Again, they create videos, and they get stuff for free. Our recent one, which we did actually in 2017, had daily missions where people got free premium content every day. So the person basically had the choice. Either I buy something because I like the content. If I don't like the content, hey, I just need to log in, I play, and I still get something for free. During Christmas, that's very beautiful because if you have happy players during Christmas, it's, it's really relaxed for everybody, especially for your community team, because the last thing you want is an outrage on the forum on Christmas. Um, we are normally ending the event by, the, by, by day 24 with a big surprise. By big surprise, I mean normally we try to get very cool and new content that has never been seen before to basically match the expectations that we are building up over 24 days. So this, I can't share any revenue numbers because it's very sensitive for us, and so I, I was asked not to do it, but I can promise you if you have the tool and for the content to actually come up with 24 nice offers and also cater to your non-payers, it's a huge success. Um, I talked about community um, before and, and the challenge of, of keeping everybody happy, uh, but also trying to understand all your, uh, all your community and not, on, uh, not focusing maybe only on the forums. So, we do a lot of events in World of Tanks. A lot of stuff um, is done on weekends where we discount uh, tech tree vehicles. At the same time, we, we sell a lot of stuff. The problem is that people get used to this very quickly and it's very, very hard to please them. Meaning, whenever we do discounts, it's not high enough anymore. Whenever we give gifts free, free stuff, it's not enough anymore. They, they always want more. Um, happy players are great to have. Unfortunately, they are not helping you in the forum because they normally, by default, when they are happy, not often go to the forum to tell you that they love you, unfortunately. And also the paying users are normally a minority, so you can't really expect too much support from those guys either. The problem in our monthly meetings became that the product owner of World of Tanks was very concerned about the negative feedback we received, and obviously nobody wants that, uh, um, uh, how to say, untackled. So we were challenged actually, do our events make sense? Michael, you're putting premium shop stuff out there, we see it generates revenue, but we see every time people complain, and I'm very concerned. Can you, can you tell me more about it? It was a bit challenging, but then we worked with our survey team in, uh, in the headquarters, and we used a couple of our actually in-game specials and premium shop offers, uh, which we did this year, uh, which were perceived negative in the forum, because again, it was not enough content, or uh, the missions were not good enough, or were too hard. And when we actually run the survey, the majority of people we ask actually really love the stuff we are doing, especially the free stuff we give away, while 70% uh, of people didn't care about our specials at all, and only a minority here are actually really, really unhappy or even upset with what we are doing. So the moment we shared those slides in our in one of our previous monthly meetings, the product owner was very pleased because it really helped not only him to understand that you know, we need to have an additional layer of feedback to be really, really uh, aware of the entire sentiment uh, we are creating by specials and premium shop. And at the same time, our community team was very pleased to see it because when you, when you deal on the forums on, on a daily basis, on Reddit or wherever you go for feedback, and you see that everything the company does in terms of promotion is terribly perceived, you get actually 
how to see, you, you, are, you are boxing yourself in and you start to believe that we are doing a terrible job. While if you ask people in a more, how to say, wider audience, suddenly the entire picture looks very, very different. Um, so from community feedback, we now go to, uh, to Margo, who will talk a bit more about the player relation management. Hi everyone, so um, basically as we said it at the beginning, uh, we have a lot of data going on and actually as you can see uh, by the time Mike spoke, look at all what happened. <laughs> um, so that's where the player relationship management platform comes in and that's what I am working on basically. So this is a tool that we develop internally um, and it will analyze uh, players' data based on selection criteria and triggers. Um, and actually, we make use of it uh, to create campaigns. So basically, if I want to do a campaign, uh, I can target uh, players who have 1,000 battles. Uh, I, can player, uh, I can target payers, non-payers. Uh, there are a lot of possibilities. And then the triggers are uh, whenever we want to communicate with the player, the player has to perform a certain action. So uh, for example, win a battle, lose a battle, and then we send the appropriate message um, and then there is this real-time communication. So that gives us a lot of opportunities to, uh, to make campaigns. Uh, we can also give those players exclusive packages. Uh, we can also give them free items for retention. We can uh, give them free missions, etc. So there are really a lot of possibilities with that. So this is how it goes, um, because we do a lot of testing with PRMP. So first we have the iteration phase. Uh, so we come up with the hypothesis. Uh, with the idea, we do some research and pre-analysis, and then we put it into a monthly plan that is ne uh, then approved. Then it goes to the testing phase, um, where we request uh, all the content, the messaging, um, the pictures, we can request illustrations only for the sake of this campaign, and uh, we launch the campaign, basically. Then we analyze it. And if we are not completely satisfied with the results, it can go back to the iteration phase where we can uh, change either conditions, offers, content, it depends. Um, and then when we are confident that um, those campaigns are doing well, uh, we launch them permanently. So it doesn't mean that we'll, we will not come back to it and uh, change it at a later date, because then it might perform a bit less at some point. Um, but yeah. And uh, for some campaigns, um, it's also useful to have a certain in-game UI so um, we offer the, the developers to actually implement them in game when they, works, uh, when they are successful. But um, we have to keep in mind that actually a lot, a lot of those test campaigns uh, go back to the iteration phase when we feel that we can still adjust them or actually if they are very, very unsuccessful, we just put them on hold. So this is an example of a promo screens. This is how we actually contact the players. This is what they see in their garage uh, when they perform the right trigger. And uh, in that case, so I was closely working with Michael uh, on a campaign to determine uh, if we were going to adjust uh, the price points to the Polish audience because they have a lower uh, purchasing power. And uh, for this one, we used a national holiday, actually, because uh, players are more likely to be at home. Uh, playing and it's also a good point of contact. So we requested uh, also like uh, a specific art for it and what we were offering basically is um, regional content because we were offering them a uh, Polish tank uh, with some resource packages like uh, gold, premium, etc. And uh, we didn't show any discount but uh, we showed, uh, they saw that the price point was a bit lower and actually it worked uh, great. There is another campaign uh, that I actually really like <laughs> and that performed really well. Uh, actually, several. It's called Hero Moments and Epic Moments. So the principle here is that you rely on the player's high moral state after a very good game to contact them, to congratulate them, and um, offer them to treat themselves, basically. So for Hero Moments, the triggers were like uh, players uh, had more than five kills, um, the players uh, were the last survivors of the game, but they still won. So they are super happy after that. And the epic medal one, so the one that you can see here, uh, is actually when the player receives an, uh, an epic medal, which is actually an achievement that, they, that is integrated in the game UI. Um, and yeah, so here, for example, we gave, gave them a 20% voucher to use in our premium shop. Uh, they could just get anything they wanted. And here you have the results. So in red, you have the target group, which are actually the users we are contacting. Um, in yellow, you have the control group, which are users who fill actually the same criteria, 
uh, they performed exactly the same trigger, but we are not contacting them at all. And as you can see, so before the offer, um, the target group was kind of below uh, the control group. But on the day of the offer, there is a huge spike, and then it remains uh, clearly above. So I will conclude now uh, with actually the challenges that we saw at the beginning. So the game has been there eight years on the market. But how do we tackle that? Uh, so we are reusing the content, we are actually promoting it, rotating it so it doesn't feel, how to say, like uh, constantly the same to the users. Um, we use the seasonal bits like uh, the advent calendar, the summer sales, etc. And we do dynamic testing through the player relationship management platform. Uh, so we need to understand our audience. Obviously, there is the community feedback that comes in place. Uh, there is another PRMP campaign that I couldn't talk to you about because uh, we lack of time, but it's called onboarding. Uh, we are targeting beginners, actually, when they just come into the game, and we are giving them uh, very basic advice on uh, how to make damage, how to protect yourself, because that's actually how we retain them the best. And, um, and they need to know that, otherwise they can get scared of the game, basically. Uh, and so the campaign analysis also uh, helps us to understand the behavior of these players. So for the high level of complexity with all the data, uh, obviously we have a lot of text testing opportunities, so that's actually a great thing. And uh, thanks to these testing opportunities, we can make a lot of data-driven decisions. And for the West versus East uh, challenge, so there is a three price point strategy that Mike talked about earlier. And uh, the geo-targeting, uh, which allows us actually to like, target players based on their regions and then uh, make the appropriate decisions to please them. So thank you. If you have any questions, uh, please feel free. Thanks. Thanks for the presentation. A uh, quick question regarding content rotation. How many tanks did you guys have in the game before you decided to actually start hiding some or uh, rotating some? Um, oh, I can't really give you the exact number, uh, because I could not even tell you how much total premium tanks we have, but it became an issue um, after we released the, the fifth or the sixth tech tree. So, because then we released it, the, the tanks really, it, it really became an issue because there are so many different tanks, and we could see from our, um, even from our community that, you know, sometimes it was like, oh, so much content. And then when we checked our revenue flow from the premium tanks, actually, because we, we dived into that after that, that's where we, the flat lines really sh sh became a problem. And that's when we started to tackle the flat lines with, with more special offers. So this tier eight of the week, which I described, is just one example we are using to put spotlight on, on content and to rotate it, but we have a couple of other options as well. And um, it works very well for the moment, but I could not really now give you the exact threshold when we start, sorry, when we started to do it. Because the reason I'm asking is on mobile game, if you have a day 30 retention of like, let's say 10%, this is like, yay, everyone's happy. So I was wondering, because we tried something similar on Hitman mm -hmm. Sniper, and I was wondering, like, at some point we were wondering, since people are leaving the game, like, you know, qu quite fast, yeah. Aren't you missing opportunity of selling if you start hiding stuff and just putting them on every three or four months? So we, I was wondering if you guys tried the strategy of not hiding them, but just uh, doing campaigns or sales on certain items instead of removing them from the store. We do actually both. So the vehicles for the T8 example I described here are so-called standard premium tanks. Uh, those vehicles by default are always available in the tech tree and we normally don't take them out. Only very rarely we do decisions like this. Now, the pool of tanks you are referring to, we have them as well. We are calling them rare premium tanks. Those vehicles are actually uh, have been developed for certain reasons, being it for special events like the Sabaton cross-promotion we had in the past or the Fury cross-promotion, the movie mid uh, 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 Sorry, I want to speak French. Uh, with, uh, with, Brad, uh, with Brad Pitt. Uh, so those are basically is, is a, a huge pool we, we gained over the last eight years, which we consider using it exactly the way you just described it. We just uh, using actually both ways all the time. Thank you. You're welcome. I have a question for Margot. First of all, thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, you had the number there that 85 of 100 campaigns are going back to the iteration phase. So does that mean that you're actually testing 100 campaigns per month? And actually, a follow-up question would be, if, uh, how do, do you and your team deal with 85% uh, failure rate? So, first of all, this is more like an indicator, uh, but we are not so far off from the 100 campaigns uh, monthly, globally, I mean. 
because I'm not the only one working on it, because I'm working on uh, EU PRMP, but we also have uh, the Asian region, uh, Russia, NA. and uh, NA. And um, so for us, it's not so much of a big deal, actually, to have campaigns going down the drain, because, uh, I mean, even though there are a few of them who, that really works, uh, they are working quite well. So we just like to iterate, we see what works, what doesn't, and of course it's always better to make uh, data-driven decisions rather than just, yeah, I mean, not testing it and not knowing if it will work. One thing I would like to add there, it goes back to the complexity and the amount of data we have. So we don't really consider 85 being a fail, because in our, our understanding, PRMP is basically something that gives you unlimited possibilities to, to uh, have an impact on monetization or retention. So the bottleneck cannot be the resource here. So that's why we're actually investing a lot of people uh, into our PRMP and engagement teams. And... Um, Again, I think our, our core understanding what we have in, in Wargaming is uh, the bottleneck cannot be the resource when it comes to PRMP because due to the data we have in World of Tanks alone, uh, that allows us nearly unlimited amount of campaigns. Thank you so much. That was very interesting. Right.